Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here. I don't have anything specific in the bulletin, but just take note of everything in the bulletin and all the different activities that are going on there. And, and uh, I know there's different things this afternoon, uh, camp meeting and that type of thing going on, so just be mindful of all that. This morning I'll read from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day that we can gather together and, and just praise and worship you. We just thank you, too, for the many blessings that you have bestowed on us through this past week, and we look forward to what you have in store for us throughout this week. I just also want to uh, just pray for the <coughs> offering that will be given, that it will be used to your honor and glory, and just uh, give the committee's wisdom as they seek to serve you and, and do it in a good means of stewardship. Just be with Pastor as well as he brings the message. Also, the other parts of the service this morning, just may they be a blessing to each one of us, and may we also be a blessing to them in return. In your name we pray, amen. amen. You guys would stand and continue worshiping.
All right. We're going to serve up the communion. We're going to sing the next song. Our servers will take their places, and if you just would walk to the wall and come and get your elements and then down the center back to your seats, both sides the same. And then we'll just wait until the song is done and the music team, if you want to grab your cups, we'll wait for you. And then we'll all do communion together, but we'll serve it out as they... And of course the elements, the uh, broken bread is the body that was broken for us on the cross. And the juice in the cup is representing the blood that Jesus shed for us. We're re to remember Christ's death, he says, right? So we are reminded that we are sinners. We deserve to be punished by God, but Christ took our place. And so when we have the cup this morning, listen to what the Bible says. Uh, don't eat or drink unworthily, but rather examine yourself before you drink that cup. If there's some reason why you should not drink this morning, just don't come. Don't, don't do any spiritual damage to yourself, but if you want to, and you're a believer, you may participate. And so this is a believer's cup that we share together. And we're going to uh, serve out the elements. We're not going to judge anyone. We want you to judge yourself. If you believe you are a Christian and you should part partake and remember Christ's death, then we want to worship and celebrate with you. Uh, all are welcome to participate. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that you gave your life for us. Your son Jesus, who died in our place, his body was beaten and broken, and the nails pierced his hands and his feet, and his spirit aside, and his blood was spilt. Because it was the shedding of blood that was to atone for sin. You in your holiness and in your love, you found a way to bring those two together. Sin could be paid for, but the sinner could be saved. And we are not worthy, but you loved us enough to do it, so we accept it, Father. Thank you for this cup that it reminds us today of what you've done for us. And so as we partake of it, we ask your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may begin to file.
everyone been served who wants to be served? Because we sure can bring the tray out to you if someone's been overlooked. The cups are double stacked. Red is on the bottom one. said when we partake together we're remembering his death so we partake of the bread and also the cup just think when we get to heaven we're going to meet the one who has the holes in his hands and in his side and it'll be a reminder to us that he paid the price for us amen thank you lord Have all the kids come up front, please. We'll be 
think you're a little kid, you can come up. I counted more than this. There we go. Okay, guys, I'm going to need your help today with our story. You know, they just flashed up on the screen, attributes of God. Does anybody know what an attribute is? I know you had a story last Sunday that talked about it. Anybody remember? Micah? Well, kind of. But what what means? What do we know? What do we want to know more about? Who do we want to know more about? God, right. So attributes means what is God like? Have you seen God? No. Nope. Me neither. Okay. This morning, pastor's message has a couple big words in it. One is holiness. What is holiness? What do you think holiness is? Can you tell me? Greatness, that's a good choice. What else? Powerful, oh, those are good words. What? Perfect, yeah. How about set apart? Loving, that is very good. Huh? And good, yes, those are good words. Well, in the other word in his sermon this morning is called and I don't know if I can even say it right. Immutability. That's a big word, isn't it? You want to try saying it? Immutability. You did good, yeah. Anybody know what that word means? Me, I had to look it up. Yep, I sure did. Okay. This word means that God cannot change. Do you remember a story about Zacchaeus. You're going to help me tell this story, okay? Okay, who was he? He was a wee little man. That's right. What happened to Zacchaeus? What kind of person was he? He was a money stealer. Yes. Yes, he who did he steal the money from? People, yeah. Okay, and then what happened to him? He heard about somebody coming to town, and who was that somebody? Well, huh? Jesus, right. Okay, um, and then Walter, I know you've had this in Sunday school, so what did Zacchaeus do? He climbed up in a sycamore tree. That's right. Why did he do that? So he could see better and see Jesus, right? Okay, so he did that. And then what happened? Okay, he passed all the people up and went to Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, come down. That's right. You guys remember that story. That's really good. Upon meeting Jesus, what did they do then? That's right. They went to Zacchaeus' house to have some supper. So something must have really happened at that house, right? Jesus was talking to Zacchaeus, Walter. He was a sinner. That is right. He was a sinner. So what happened, though, with Jesus there? Did he... What happened to Zacchaeus then? They don't come up here. That's okay. They can hear the story back there. Okay. 
Um, what happened to Zacchaeus at his house? Jesus told him to give the money back to the people, right? Okay, why did he do that? I mean, if you were in a habit of stealing things from other people, would you want to go and say, I'm sorry I stole your money? No. But what do you have to do when you do that? You have to change, right? Well, guys, immutability means to change. Or not change, sorry. <laughs> um, Zacchaeus changed because he was a sinner, and he learned that from Jesus, right? Jesus told him he'd done all these bad things. So, um, yeah, I lost my train of thought here. Jesus um, responded to the crowds that he had come to seek and save because the people didn't understand why Jesus would take and go to Zacchaeus' house and not theirs. But Jesus said the crowds, uh, to the crowds that he had come to seek and save. Who changed in the story? Zacchaeus did. God didn't change, right? Right. Did uh, Zacchaeus change on his own? No. He had to have help to see that he was wrong, right? So Jesus helped to change him. Okay. Um, and the only way uh, that is possible is when God works in our hearts. Zacchaeus wants a man who loved money more than anything else in the world. And, um, but he changed into a man who loved God more than anything else after he met Jesus. Are there any things today that uh, can change about you? What, Micah? To know about God more. That's good. Okay, well, I'm going to, since you guys are such good listeners, I'm going to give you a piece of candy but it will change, okay? It changes from a hard piece of candy to a very soft piece of candy, okay? All right. Thank you for being good listeners. close the door but he followed me wait until halfway through this week you'll know why I'm talking about it anyway it is summer after all right um, today's attributes we're looking at God's holiness and God's immutability um, let's start in Isaiah chapter 6 the first seven verses Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 7 in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah has gone into the temple and in the temple there was, there was a curtain, okay? And God, where the mercy seat was to receive the forgiveness from God was behind that curtain. And so when anyone went into the temple, they never had a chance to see God. Because Exodus had said, Moses had been told by God in Exodus 33 verse 20, no one can see God and live. And so Isaiah has a very interesting experience. As he goes into the temple that day, he sees the Lord seated on the throne. And look what happens. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
and the kids singing that song, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord. And that comes right out of passages like this one. And notice that it's interesting that I found that the only characteristic or attribute of God that is always mentioned three times in a row is God's holiness. It didn't say that God is love, love, love. But it does say God is holy, holy, holy. It didn't say God is patient, patient, patient. But it does say he is holy, holy, holy. Very interesting. And I don't know why they do that, but I have a suspicion. I don't know if it's going to come out or not, but I'm just saying that God indeed is holy. Okay, so Isaiah has this experience that the holy God whom the angels cried, holy, 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 is right there in the temple. The whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then, this is Isaiah speaking. Then I said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He just becomes undone. He realizes, I'm not supposed to be seeing this. And I think I'm going to die. I'm a sinful man and I live among sinful people and I have just, as a sinful man, I have just come in contact with the Holy God. We don't think about God in that way, but we should. We should. And I'm going to explain to you why. Okay? Isaiah also said in chapter 57, verse 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. And him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God dwells in a lofty, high and holy place. How are sinful people, this is Isaiah's understanding, how are sinful people going to accomplish to be where he is? It would be virtually an impossibility because of the holiness of God. Okay, 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, there is none as holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. No one is as holy as God. Even the holiest thing that we can think of is not even close to how holy God is. Revelation 4, verse 8, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So this is at the end of the Bible. John the Apostle is having a vision of what he sees in heaven. And he sees there these angels. And they too have the same experience to cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord. All right, so God's holiness. The word holiness by itself is godesh, G-O-D-E-S-H. means apartness separateness or sacredness okay theologically god's holiness means that he is utterly set apart from all creation and all evil okay so it just shows that there's a huge distance between a holy god and sinful man everything that is sinful is far removed from a holy god and god has to in order to stay holy, which he never would be anything but holy. He, it's, it's almost like, it's like a huge magnet that the two opposite polar ends, they, they push away from each other. It's impossible to penetrate the holiness of God as a sinner. So that's, that's what, that's what we're, we're learning. It means set apart, okay, sacred. God is in a category all by himself. Okay, so when we talk about the holiness of God, we're referring to God's absolute moral perfection and uniqueness. No one else like him. Absolute moral perfection. Not a hint or a thought of sin in our God. So that's why God has to separate himself from us. And this is why in the temple there was this curtain called a veil, right? And it just showed the people that as a sinner, you can't come into contact with God because God is holy. Okay, so now let's look at this. James chapter 1 verse 13 says this, let no man or let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay, the very idea of sin, either in God some sin in God, or some sin coming from God is 
in our minds, it must be inconceivable. It cannot be, right? No sin is in God. Nothing unclean or unholy can come from God. Where does it come from? It comes from the evil sin of man, right? We are the ones who are sinful. God himself is not. Okay, so that's, that's why there's a separation between us and God. The very idea of sin either in God or coming from God is inconceivable because of his purity. Now, we measure sin in degrees of our idea of badness, right? Some people say, well, they think their sin is, is not as bad as the next guy. I mean, the next guy, he has, and they can list them, right? I mean, everyone has a different standard. We measure differently because I like to think if I did the same thing as you, I mean, you just would have a totally different bad attitude worse than mine yet. So even if my sin is the same as yours, yours is still worse than mine. We don't, we don't know how to measure it properly. Because even there, we have a sinful measurement. Now think about a holy God. Is his measurement flawed in any which way? No. Okay, so how does God see sin? God has no such standard as we do. Now different sins have different consequences. We understand that, right? I can do something small and I have a small consequence. I can do something big and it can be a big consequence. Or, or I can do something small and I can have a chain reaction consequence, right? Okay, different sins have different consequences and even different punishments. Sometimes God holds back some consequences in my life because he's being gracious. Next time he allows consequences to happen. Seemingly when I do the same thing but I don't have the same punishment from God. And we're, and we're that way with our children too. Uh, sometimes your children respond differently and so when you do something to discipline one of your children and your other, if you have more than one child and the other children are watching and then next time you do something different, they say, well, hey, how come you're treating that child different? Well, I'm not really. This child doesn't respond to that so I gotta find a different way to discipline them for the same thing that another child has done. It's gotta be something that is fair and equitable and yet it has to work. Okay, so there are different Consequences and different punishments, but in God's mind and in comparison to God, evil has only one degree of evilness. Evil. Okay? This is why a bad thought is just as evil to God as would be murder. Does that make sense? The, the, the reason that an evil thought to God is just as evil as a murderer because of how pure God is. He has only one standard of evil, and that's evil. Our sins will have different consequences, different punishments. Okay, so just imagine, okay, a surgeon. A surgeon has two scalpels, okay, he's gonna do a surgery. One scalpel is dirty, and the other one is mostly sterile, and it has a few spots on it. But it's 90% it's sterile. Which one would you want him to use if he were your surgeon? Neither one. I want a surgeon who has a 100% sterile scalpel before he starts cutting. Now listen, that little spot on that scalpel can be as bad as the dirty one. That little spot can be as bad as that dirty one. It takes only a small germ to contaminate the whole body. You want someone with a completely sterile scalpel to be used for your surgery. And that's what God is. God is so completely holy. He is so sterile that he is as equally offended by an evil thought as he is over a murder. God does not have that difference of comparison. How he chooses to bring consequences can differ. But as far as offense against the holy God, one spot is the same as an entirely dirty scalpel. Okay, so that's that. So the holiness of God creates a problem. Because someone who is as holy as God is, not only must he separate himself from us, right? He has to keep himself separate because he, can do, he cannot fellowship. He, he cannot be in close contact with anything sinful. So he is utterly set apart. That's what the word holiness really means. And not only that, because he is holy, he would have to punish the sin. He cannot not punish the sin. 
A holy God cannot sweep sin under the rug, so to speak. I saw a meme the other day in that uh, everything is sticking out from underneath the rug and it's got this great big hill in the center of the room. And they said, I think we need to get a bigger rug. (laughs) Yikes, right? God has no such philosophy. God must deal with every sin his holiness demands it. He cannot skip over sin, okay? Such a holy judge must always by nature have a judgment for sin. If you go into a courtroom and there's a judge at the bench, that judge has to have a judgment for every crime that comes into his courtroom. He cannot just say, okay, this crime, we're just not going to look at it. We're just going to let it go. He would not be a good and holy and fair judge. Okay, and our God promises that he will not overlook our sin. Okay, so God's righteousness, which is another one of God's attributes. It's not really what we're discussing today, but I want us to understand that his righteousness flows from his holiness. Okay, so when we think about righteousness, okay, holiness, what God is. Holy, pure, perfect, right? Righteousness is what God does. Okay, have you heard of practicing what one preaches? Why does God do what is right? Because he is holy. Okay, those two go together. The righteousness of God, we're talking about what God does. Every action, every act of God is always right and loving. It can be no other because our God is right and righteous and loving. Okay, so now we have, we understand God's holiness. He can't skip over sin. His righteousness uh, flows from his holiness. God has, because of his holiness and because of his righteousness, he has a perfect justice. His justice is never miscalculated or misplaced. He's never wrong about a judgment. Because he is holy and he is perfect and he is righteous. Okay, it's very, very, to me, it's very important to understand this because if we're planning on being in his presence one day, we should figure on, we should figure on, we would have to be as righteous as he is, as holy as he is in order to enjoy the greatest of fellowships. How can we sinners be as holy as God is? This is a problem. I I can't attain that level of holiness or righteousness. And so that's why God is separate from sinners, right? This This is why everything was displayed in the Old Testament with the veil. And God is behind the curtain and the killing of a, of a sacrifice so that there was blood. And then the high priest would take the blood in behind the veil once a year. And he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, so to speak. He rolls the note over for another year. Every year, he rolls the note for another year. God shows grace and mercy again for another year. Over and over and over and over. But the curtain is still there. And then comes Good Friday. The Lord Jesus is nailed to the cross. What happened to the veil of the temple? Torn open. Similarly, those priests or those people who were in the temple, because it was the Passover season, they would be working. Some are worshiping because it's like we have Easter celebrations, Good Friday. They had Passover celebrations. And suddenly... In plain view, the curtain opens up. Ah, we're not supposed to see this. So they, they would go backwards and they would somehow try and fix this thing. Because we cannot see what's behind that curtain. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really clear demonstration of the sinfulness of man, the holiness of God. There's a separation between us. Until... Until God put Jesus on the cross. God always has to act righteously because he is holy. So when God judges sin, he must always do so righteously, justly, and lovingly because he is holy, righteous, and loving. He must 
destroy sin. But he does not have to destroy the sinner. See that? That's how they come together at the cross. At the cross, God will deal with sin in a just manner because his holiness demands that sin must be accounted for. It's got to be paid. But it doesn't have to be paid by the sinner. See, that's why we have the substitutionary lamb in the Old Testament. An innocent lamb's blood was shed. And then all the way through the Old Testament, finally, our sin went on to Jesus. And then Jesus died in our place. So God could be loving toward a sinner. God could be just and right in dealing with the sin and still not violate his holiness or his love. And he brings them all together. And it's a beautiful picture of how we want to defeat cancer, but we want to walk away healed. Right? We see that. Just like God. God wants to deal with the cancer, sin. But he who doesn't want to have me, who is the sinner, to ultimately pay the devastating price of being separated from God. So God separated himself from us so that he could put our sin on Jesus so that now he opened up the fellowship for us. And we're going to look at that here in just a moment. Okay, so let's first look at God's holy standard and God's just judgment of sin and to cu coupled with God's immutability. Okay, immutability, God cannot change. The words, the prefix I am or I in, in or in, means not. Okay, so if you have a not in front of mutating, mutation means change. God is not im changing, mutable. Okay, so there are other examples of the word like, for example, the word possible. You put an I am in front of possible, now it's not possible. Or you have the word sufficient. Put an I in in front of sufficient. Insufficient, not sufficient, not possible, not changing. Okay, so these are some of the attributes, you might say, or characteristics of God that we call negative. They're negative attributes of God. And another, the way to look at them is, here's what God is like. God is holy. God is righteous. God is love. Let, and so to understand what our God is like, here's some things that we have to understand that God is not like. What is God not like? He is not changing. Aren't you glad for God not changing? I am. What's he going to change into? What do you want him to, what about him do you want to change? Which part of God would you like to see changed? Hmm. Right? If, if, if change is possible in God, then we can just forget about the fact that he is holy. He probably isn't because he's not fully perfect, right? He can still change into perfection. Or we're saying if God changes that today he is holy, but he may not be tomorrow. Well, what's going to happen then when he judges my sin? If he changed. No, no, no. God cannot change. What he is today is what he has always been. And what he is today, he always will be. Look at some of these scriptures. Hebrews 13, 8, for example. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's another one, Hebrews 6, 18. Here are two unchanging things. God cannot lie, and thus he offers an unchanging hope. Let me just uh, tell you about that. Okay, two things that will not, never change. That Jesus is our high priest forever, and that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Can never change. God can never ever change the one who went to the cross for us, namely Jesus. When God's decision is made, it stands. It cannot be altered. When God said to Adam, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. God had to follow through. He cannot not follow through. See, that's the importance. This tells us that just like the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is fixed in heaven. It never changes. This is why God is so trustworthy. 
Because he never changes a promise. He never could break a promise. He could never lie. Because he is holy. That's why he can't lie. Well, also because he's the truth. See how they work together, the attributes of God? The unchanging character of God is why his promises take that nature of being unchanging. This is why God's word takes the nature of it being unchanging. Because change is not possible with God. Who God was is who he is, and who he is is who he's going to be. That's why he calls himself the I am. Not the I was or the I want to be. I am. Right? That's it. I mean, he is just who and what he is. Now, his actions can change. How he deals with people, how he deals with situations can change, but he can't change. So, for example, when God said uh, of my life that the death sentence was on me because I was a sinner, God had declared me guilty. I was a sinner, and in the courtroom of heaven, with God as the judge, I was on death row, and there was nothing I could do about it. Now I'm not on death row. That's my testimony. I got off a of death row. You're going to say, Ken, how'd you do it? I didn't do anything. God did it. Jesus stepped in and paid the price that I was guilty for, and God declared Ken righteous. God didn't change. God changed me. I was the object of God's wrath because God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? Because he's holy. Why does God have to punish sin? Because he's holy. Because he's just. A just judge does not sweep sin under the rug. He doesn't let us get by with it. So here, a holy God who must punish sin is so to speak letting a sinner off the hook. And the reason is, is because my sin went on to Jesus, and then God punished Jesus. He was punishing me. He took my place. See how he punished my sin and did not have to punish the sinner. If, if you can't understand that point, then you are just sunk in your whole spiritual life because there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves holy enough to be pleasing to God. This just a, a, we, God is so far separate, holy, from us that it has created an impossible situation. Unless we humble ourselves and we say, I deserve the punishment for my sin, it would be right. God is a righteous judge. God is being holy. God is being truthful to punish my sin. It's right. God is acting right to punish me. Now I have to say, God is also acting right by putting my sin onto an innocent substitute. It's also right. God is not wrong to allow someone else to pay for our sin. God could not do something that's wrong. <coughs> See, and th th this, is, this is why studying the attributes of God is going to change your life. Because you and I, we realize that our sin has to be accounted for. And the way God accounts for it is through Christ. He lays our sin on Jesus and Jesus pays the price. So that we can be off death row and then he can let us live. Otherwise, there's no legal basis for God's holiness has to be satisfied. God's, God's wrath has to be settled. It has to be. And so when God says that it's settled... I accept that. Because how am I going to change it? And, and people all, all often, there's a lot of struggle that people have in their minds about, you know, can you lose your salvation? Or, or how do we know for sure if we die, we'll be in heaven? Well, we know for sure this, that if it was based on what we can do, ain't no way you can kiss it goodbye, so to speak, right? It's over with. But since it's not on what I've done, since God in his mercy found a way to act loving toward me, yet be holy and to be righteous in his actions of putting Jesus on the cross for me, I accept that. 
See how my life is revolutionized because I'm set free. I don't, I don't have to worry now that God's going to one day change or change his mind about Ken's sin. Ken's sin is still paid for by Jesus. God can't change that. He's not changing it from Jesus and putting it back on me because it is impossible for our God to change. And besides, if he, if he changed, then his promises are no good. That's John 3, 16, whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. You can't trust it then. And this is why God's word is so trustworthy is because of these things. Okay? God must punish sin, but thank God he cannot change, but we can. And so he changes us so that his character is not violated. Now he fellowships with us. He takes us in as his children. He treats us like he treats Jesus because he can. Why can he? Because legally and theologically, my sin has been paid for. God has satisfied the justice which his holiness demanded. And it's just so awesome. I could just, I don't even have the words to say. God's justice demanded that all sin be punished, but not that every sinner be punished. God brought his own son to the cross to satisfy justice and thus is able to divert his wrath from off of me and still remain perfectly holy and unchanging. The only way God could make me holy enough for his spirit, who is holy, we call him the Holy Spirit, right? That Holy Spirit lives within me, and I'm a sinful man. God had to make a new nature within me that is not holy where he dwells, and when I die, this old nature and this old guy just put me in a coffin and put me in the ground. I am out of here. Right, the new nature that has Christ living with it is present with the Lord when I die. I'm going to shed this old body with all of its sinful desires. But thank goodness God has made a new creation. And the old guy that was once here, he's gone. And I have been made new. And the same is true of you if you've received Christ as your Savior. God could not have fellowship with anything that is sinful. And this is why... As Christians, we do damage to our spiritual growth and our fellowship with a Father who loves us when we dabble and practice sinful things. This is why. Right? God has made us holy. He's not going to change that. And you know how it says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. He always remains faithful to Himself. He always remains faithful to His promises because his character demands that he does. And he does it willingly. He's not forced to do it. No, no one could force God to do anything. He's all powerful. He does it because he wants to do it. This is, this is the ultimate point, right? He knew his holiness would create this great rift between us. And so he designed a way for his holiness and our sinfulness to come together and to create a fellowship that's possible for God because the Holy God could not fellowship with anything sinful. It, 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 it could not happen. So he had to make me as holy as he himself is. The only way to do that is to fully remove my sin off me and put it on Jesus, satisfy his wrath, create a new me, drop the spirit within me and says, <coughs> not only do you have an adoption, I've given you a new citizenship and he's given me an ambassadorship and one of these days, he's going to call the ambassadors home. How about that? Home is where? In heaven. That high and lofty and holy place where God dwells. How is that my home? A miracle must have taken place. Because this old guy, how is he going to manage it? I am so glad that God showed us in his word that he was going to do that and make that possible. Otherwise... Sinful people are going to try and try and try and try to get to God and they will never get there. Can't. Because of God's nature. So let's end with this. When we see injustice in the world, it's important to remember the holiness of God 
and his righteous justice that he administers in the world. Even when it may not look like it, we're saying, how, how, that's an injustice. How come God does nothing to about that, right? Or we say, how come God is allowing something so sinful to happen? That's, that's a discussion for a whole other day. Suffice it now to say this. If God, this is just the, the base foundation of theology. If God took everything evil completely out of this world, how many people would be left? Zero. Before we say, remember what it looked like in Genesis chapter 6 when God took evil off the world? There were eight people left in the world. And the only reason they were is because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't deserve it either. He himself was a sinner. But God decided to keep eight people alive. That's what it looks like when God takes evil off the earth. <coughs> and have you read the end of the book in Revelation when God puts evil away? It's a bloodbath. It's a bloodbath. Revelation 19 says when Christ returns on a horse, all the armies of the world are gathered together to make war with him who sat on that horse. All the armies of the world want to get Jesus. Satan didn't get him earlier. Right? Herod missed him when he was born. He thought he had a net of, of every baby two years old. Of course, Christ was not two years old, but he went. Two years old, at least, let's make sure we get him. He didn't get him. Then we'll nail him to a cross 30 years later. Now we'll finally do what Caesar and what Pilate couldn't get done. They couldn't keep Jesus dead. <coughs> and here comes the rider on the white horse. He returns from heaven. All the armies of the world. Now it's not going to be just one government. All the governments of the world, they come up against the rider on the horse. Two words. Jesus wins. He wins. Not powerful. If he wants to fellowship with us, he makes a way. And he did. And so that's the way we have to enter into have fellowship with him. So when it doesn't look like God is administering true justice in the world, it still is nonetheless true. And one day, see, God is patient also, right? He waits for people to correct before he steps in. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful that you are such a holy God and that you always will be holy. You never will change. Because you are holy, you had to make a way because, because of your holiness, there was no way for us. Now you made a way. Oh, Lord, we're grateful. Without the way that you made, it would be impossible. Thank you, Lord. You'll never change. You'll never change your mind. Every promise will remain. You'll do everything you said you're going to do. Wow, we can trust you, Lord. We can trust you. And we do trust you. And we thank you.